Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for a global vaccine access strategy, the moral imperative for an equitable approach. I'm Stephen Ruckman, Deputy Director of the SNF Agora Institute, an academic center and public forum at Johns Hopkins University that is dedicated to improving and expanding civic engagement and informed inclusive dialogue as the cornerstone of global democracy. I wanna thank SNF Agora visiting fellow Scott Warren for organizing today's panel and our guests, Frida Ramay Hidalgo, Preeti Krishtel and Reshma Ramachandran for spending their lunch hour with us today to help lead this important discussion. Today's conversation will focus on COVID-19 vaccine distribution and administration and the need for an equitable global access plan. While cases are falling in the United States and parts of the global north, thanks to a robust vaccination strategy, COVID cases and deaths are increasing at alarming rates in India, Southeast Asia, and other areas where vaccines aren't as available. Our panel today will explore the current state of vaccine distribution and the biomedical, financial, and geostrategic reasons that the global response has lagged. We will also discuss the ethical and practical realities of a more equitable plan moving forward, including providing concrete recommendations on how to accelerate that process. Today's session will last about 35 or 40 minutes um, among the panelists, and then we will take questions from the audience for the balance of the time. Just, just a reminder that um, you, you are welcome to submit your questions at any time during the program using the Q&A function, and the moderator will be choosing questions to pose live to the panelists. So would the panelists all turn their cameras on now? Thank you so much. I am pleased to introduce uh, the moderator for today's discussion, Scott Warren, an SNF Agora Visiting Fellow and a Visiting Fellow at the German Marshall Fund. Scott is the founder of the National Civics Education Organization, Generation Citizen, which seeks to transform civics education so that young people are equipped and inspired to exercise their civic power. He is currently organizing a global network of youth activists and scholars focused on promoting democracy called Democracy Moves, and working with the German Marshall Fund's Fortifying Democracy Initiative to investigate how cities can promote civic participation and democratic engagement. Scott's also helping us at Johns Hopkins explore our role as a beacon of civic engagement and democracy. So I'll turn it over to Scott now, who will introduce our panelists. Thanks so much, Stephen. Um, it's really exciting to, to, to be here. Uh, and a huge thank you to Preeti, to Reshma, to, to Frida for, for joining us as well. Um, for uh, what is an incredibly timely conversation. And so uh, excited to, to get their, their thoughts on this um, uh, as, as, as we get into to, to the conversation. Um, I first wanted to introduce all of our panelists and I'll set the stage and, and get right into, uh, into to the meat of the conversation. Um, so first we have Frida Romay Hidalgo, who's a Mexican lawyer from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Uh, she's interested in global health, Mike anti-microbial resistance, bioethics, political theory, and gender equity. She's been a research assistant in several projects at the Legal Research Institute at UNAM and the Mexican National Institute of Public Health. She's currently volunteering in the non-governmental organization Movimiento CUS as coordinator of bioethics, which is part of Democracy Moves, the network Stephen talked about. She's worked on legal and policy issues in the public and private sectors. Thank you for, for being with us here today, Frida. Uh, we next have Priti Cristel, a health justice lawyer and co-founder of IMAC, a nonprofit building a more just and equitable medicine system. Pretty spent nearly two decades exposing structural inequities affecting access to medicines and vaccines across the global south and in the US. That includes advocating for equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines across the globe to ensuring that the Biden-Harris administration is prioritizing equity in the patent and trademark office. Uh, and finally, we have Reshma Ramachandran, uh, an MD and MPPP, who's a health service researcher, family physician, and National Clinician Scholars Program Fellow at the Yale School of Medicine. Her research focuses on the realignment of incentives for healthcare stakeholders, including pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, and universities towards prioritizing patients over profits will be a part of the conversation today. Prior to this role, Reshma worked as research faculty as part of the Innovation and Design Enabling Access Initiative at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where she focused on antimicrobial resistance and access to medicines, 
including state and federal drug, drug pricing proposals. Uh, she currently serves as co-chair of the National Steering Committee for Doctors for American Drug Affordability Action Team. Uh, welcome, Reshma, Frida, and Preeti. So excited to, to have you all here today. Um, so let's let's ground the conversation. Stephen did did some of this, um, but but I woke to news, which which many of us did, that throughout the United States, um, things are getting back to normal. And and specifically, uh, if we think about um, New York, New York announced today that basically everything is is back to normal. No masks. Uh, places can go to 100% capacity. At the same time, we saw today. Uh, that we had the largest 24 hour death count in a country over the course of pandemic uh, in India. And so New York was the epicenter for the virus for so long, going back to normal. Uh, we had the largest death uh, intake in, in a single country over the entire course of, of a pandemic. And so these, uh, these realities in terms of the US getting back to normal, but throughout the world and places like India, uh, it, it seems like the pandemic is worse than it ever has been. In the context of SNF Agora, I'm, I'm really interested in explaining what this means uh, for democracy. Um, we, we have certain countries that are doing very well, certain countries that, that aren't. Um, what is the, the US role? Is it just for, for us to get our citizens back to, to, to normal or to lead the rest of the world? Um, and, and so th these are the types of, of, of conversations I want to get into today. I, I want to start just by grounding in what's going on with the, 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 the global vaccine uh, access, distribution, and administration. Where are we in terms of the realities, in terms of, of global access and administration? Um, and Preeti, maybe, maybe we, can, um, we, can, we can start with you. Sure. So when the pandemic first hit, we raised the alarm at the Access to Medicines movement that we really live in a hierarchy of health. So how people were going to be able to access vaccines was going to be completely dependent on where folks fall on the economic ladder. Uh, we've seen that in the high income countries in terms of who's being left behind. Uh, and we are certainly seeing that today as large parts of the world are going completely without vaccine access. A lot of what our movement has tried to draw attention to is the fact that the monopolistic models on which we have relied to develop vaccines and treatments and then distribute them are not gonna work in a moment like this. They haven't worked for any of the pandemics of the last two decades, and they're certainly not working right now. Just yesterday, we heard from uh, the main supplier in India, Serum Institute, who was supposed to be supplying the vaccine to COVAX, which is the international mechanism that's supposed to be distributing these vaccines, that they're going to be now another seven months behind. And this is the danger of a monopolistic model where we have single suppliers that we're putting so much faith in. And for a number of reasons, that isn't going to come to fruition right now. And meanwhile, we're hearing that 6,000 people a day are dying in India and Brazil alone. Reshma, I'm, I'm curious if you could weigh in on that too. What, what can we do about the fact that there is this monopolistic, uh, you know, uh, approach to, to vaccine um, uh, distribution at, at this moment in time? Yeah, I mean, these are like really great questions. And it's I was reflecting actually yesterday and I think in recent weeks um, after seeing so many loved ones and friends and family um, in India going through this, um, that what's happening in India right now is reflective of my time in the hospital last year at the same time where I was getting messages and alerts in my um, hospital in basket of my primary care patients either being admitted to the hospital um, or to the ICU um, or dying. And so the difference now is that we just have a difference in terms of vaccine access. Um, it, it's, it's just remarkable just to, to think about that we're in the same place um, around the globe that we were last year. Um, I think, you know, one big thing that we, we, we should keep in mind is that, you know, the public ultimately funded um, the development, the manufacturing, and the purchase of these vaccines. We've secured a market, we've de-risked, you know, the, the, these vaccines, and it's a remarkable feat that we do have vaccines in this record time. And with that, you know, the U.S. government in taking taxpayer dollars and, you know, providing these vaccines has a special responsibility um, to ensure that this pandemic not only comes to an end here, but across the globe. And that means not signing away um, control over not just the price, but also the supply of the vaccines. And effectively, that's what they did in these initial contracts. 
These contracts are not set in stone, though. There is an ability that for the US government through various legal mechanisms and really in the moment of a public health emergency that's affecting so many across the globe and will come again and reach our shores if we do not take action for them to step in. Um, to recenter the pandemic really on patients and people around the world and not just on the pharmaceutical companies. Um, so I think we're at this moment right now, this inflection point of where countries need uh, and world leaders need to really have political will um, to be able to put people above these pharmaceutical companies and be able to lead the charge both here in the United States, but really for the rest of the world as well. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Excited to, to get more into what that actually looks like. Frida, I'd love to turn it over to you as, as someone that's on the ground in Mexico right now. Um, what, what's, I'd love to hear what's, what's going on with vaccination in Mexico? What's the latest? What's your response to, to some of what Priti and, and, and Reshma uh, articulated as well? Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Scott, and all the folks at the SNF Agora Institute and Democracy Moves who put this panel together. I am immensely honored to be part of this conversation with two brilliant panelists, and of course, you, Scott. And to begin to answer your question, I would like to stress that Mexico has done very well in diplomacy and international relations concerning COVID-19 vaccines. Um, five types of vaccines are available here in Mexico. Those are the Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Sputnik, CoronaVac, and CanSino. Four of them are two-dose vaccines and one is a single dose. This was made possible by the efforts of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And Mexico is also part of the mechanism uh, which is known as COVAX. This will allow it to receive almost six and a half million more vaccines than those already covered by previously signed agreements with pharmaceutical companies. And more than 23 million doses of vaccines have been administered until yesterday, representing 19% of the total population. Also, we still have a long way to reach the 70 or 80% of this collective immunity. And in Mexico, we must continue all the preventive measures to avoid a resurgence or a forecoming wave, like in Chile, who were, who were uh, one of the countries where more people have been vaccinated in Latin America. So, the government immunization strategy follow different phases. The first ones to be vaccinated were healthcare professionals and hospital workers who attended to patients infected with coronavirus, followed by the elderly, and currently teachers at all levels of education, pregnant women and people aged um, 50 to 59 are being vaccinated at the same time. However, um, vaccination of these groups has not been entirely successful. There are still many healthcare professionals, especially in the private sector, who have not been vaccinated. And the risk communication campaign also failed because a considerable percentage of older adults didn't take their second dose. So they ended with an incomplete vaccine scheme that doesn't guarantee the efficacy of the vaccines. So misinformation and fake news are a concerning threat, especially in countries like Mexico, which are very inequitable because most of the population does not have access to scientific information and doesn't know, doesn't know how to identify a trusted information source. So, to conclude, I would like to stress that there are challenges that are not just related to the number of vaccines we acquire, the entire process of research, development, approval, scaling, distribution of vaccines and medicine necessary to treat the most severe cases of COVID-19 is uncertain in an economy of knowledge and innovation that favors some 
and lives in the exclusion, vulnerability, and invisibility to many. So the current, si the current situation of vaccine production and distribution, we already know, is apparently unique and unfair. Thanks so much, Frida. That's that's fascinating all around, both to hear what Mexico is doing well and some of the challenges. I, I'm curious, Frida, maybe we can start with you. Um, what what sort of dictates what what countries are actually getting access to vaccines versus which ones aren't? Which countries are having successful vaccination campaigns versus which ones aren't? I feel like it's hard to to grapple through all of this. So so what actually is dictating a country that's that's actually getting access to them versus not? And then as Frida was talking about, that's actually um, that's actually administrating the vaccines, which seems to be a whole a whole separate challenge. Yeah, so from the beginning of the pandemic, what we've seen is what's being called in the press vaccine nationalism, which is higher income countries are hoarding, uh, basically buying up, which is understandable, actually, given that at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, countries in Europe and the United States were hit so hard by the pandemic. So sort of a reactive move. Uh, purchase as much of the potential supply as possible. But I think what's become very clear uh, as the pandemic has unfolded is that this hoarding was the wrong strategy for public health. From a public health perspective, uh, what experts have been saying from day one is we needed to make sure that all countries had an equitable allocation so that we could uh, cut the number of deaths in half so we could make sure we came out of this pandemic more quickly. And that just didn't happen. High income countries, including our own, the United States, hoarded supply, entered into bilateral purchasing contracts with different companies to buy potential supply, um, and now are very slowly trickling out donations when countries like India are in search. So this is not the model that we should be employing as a matter of pandemic response right now, and it's certainly not the model that we want for the future. Rashma, I'm curious from, from your take on this, this vaccine nationalism approach that led to countries like the US hoarding, what's the alternative? If a, if a domestic government is, we have to take care of our own people and we have more money, therefore we're going to get more vaccines. Um, it seems logical to some extent, how do we get past that? Um, and, and, and why should governments in the US actually care about vaccinating the rest of the world? Yeah, I mean, so I, I, you know, to Preeti's point, you know, the U.S. government and a number of other high-income countries did enter these bilateral agreements, but I think there was some recognition, even from the World Health Organization, that this vaccine nationalism was going to threaten global vaccine access, particularly for the poorest countries around the world, and that's what led to the emergence of COVAX, um, this collaboration between the Coalition for um, Epidemic uh, Preparedness, um, and then also the Gavi, the Global Vaccine Alliance. Um, and the idea of this was to be able to provide 20% um, uh, of you know, doses um, to the 97 poor countries around the world to be able to ensure more equitable distribution. But um, that mechanism, plus also the coronavirus technology access pool that the WHO also set up, recognizing that manufacturing cap capacity had to be distributed worldwide, um, has, not, um, has not worked really well. And in fact, I would say right now is failing um, to be able to ensure vaccine access. Um, a lot of this is because, again, you know, we've allowed these bilateral agreements to go forward. They've been happening oftentimes in secret. The U.S. government and other high-income countries secured um, agreements with premium prices given to companies, which then incentivize them to fill the orders for the United States and other high-income countries first, leaving, leaving the rest of the world behind and leading these WHO mechanisms, which were set up as a way to show global solidarity towards vaccine access, um, just left in the dust, to be honest. And yesterday's announcement from Serum Institute, the manufacturer that Prithian mentioned, um, which had notified you know, the rest of the world that they would not be able to provide vaccine doses to COVAX um, or to other countries by the end of the year. And this was the manufacturer that COVAX was relying on was a huge blow. It's a nightmare situation as one of our colleagues called it for global vaccine access. And 
it's um, it's telling to see that um, you know companies you know incentivized again by profit and to their shareholders um, are filling the orders of high income countries first and not really you know giving a, a care to, in, in in my mind to low and middle income countries and what they're facing in terms of vaccine access. Why Americans should care about this is because of the virus itself. The virus knows no borders, and we are seeing rapidly emerging variants across the world. The more that people are left unvaccinated in so many countries, including here in the United States, we only have uh, about 40% of people that have are fully vaccinated. We are going to see more and more variants rising, and that's going to mean modified vaccines, more booster doses that will be needed. And, and as a result of that, um, we're going to be facing a national security risk here in the United States as Americans are fully vaccinated and not being prepared for those variants that are going to reach our shores as we start opening up borders, as people start going on vacation, as, as protect, pandemic protections are also dropped. So there has to be a recognition that this virus is not something that's going to stay within borders. It's not um, something that's only going to be affecting high income countries and low income, middle income countries separately. It is a global pandemic. And the fact that our world leaders are kind of acting like it's not a global pandemic is particularly troubling to see, especially at this moment where we're seeing record numbers of, of folks that we're not even sure of the numbers, really, to be honest, in, uh, in uh, low middle income countries, including my home country of India. Um, and so at, at this point, I think these sorts of global mechanisms need to be able to give it, to, to be empowered and given in you know, a full investment, there has to be really dramatic rethinking in terms of what does being a global citizen and global solidarity during this pandemic look like. Um, and that means kind of revisiting a lot of these bilateral agreements and, and saying that we should have a reallocation in terms of how many doses are being purchased for countries, especially because the United States and a number of high income countries have purchased doses far and above beyond their actual need. We're actually seeing you know, multiple times over the amount of vaccine doses that are needed to vaccinate the entire adult population here in the United States. And so uh, you know, immediate reallocation is gonna be important, but then again, kind of investment that's gonna be rapidly going towards low middle income countries to ensure manufacturing and transfer of this technology so the control of supply and price is out of these multinational companies and really given to the rest of the world. Um, thanks for, for all of that. Frida, I want to turn to you in a second, but, but pretty, I'd love to go back to you just uh, almost more of a technical question. Why, why did the Serum Institute not, was it a surprise that they were unable to, to, to fulfill their, their, their COVAX distribution? Why did it happen? What, what can be done? I think this is a complicated question, so I don't want to, uh, I don't know that I want to wade into the waters. Uh, I think that I would just say for now that I would point back to the fact that this is the reason you don't want to rely on a single supplier. Um, there may be production challenges. There may be the fact that India is in a surge, so the government is wanting any existing capacity to be deployed domestically. Um, there may be very challenging situations in India with the leadership right now, um, trying to control the supply and not allowing for a more expansive global production than there needs to be. And so because there are so many reasons that could be driving what's happening, um, I think the main problem right now, uh, if we go back to the root source, is why were these this vaccine and other vaccines not being given to multiple manufacturers in India in other emerging markets with production capacity, why are we trying to hold on to control of the supply? And so when you look at actually right now, there's a lot of celebration of President Biden's statement a couple of weeks ago that we are as a country going to be supporting a waiver on intellectual property to try to encourage as many manufacturers as possible to start producing. The truth of the matter is the conversations that are happening here in the United States are still centering around this idea of how can we get our companies to figure out how to increase supply? How do we as the US government control the supply domestically and start to export? How do we donate our leftovers? That's not a global solution. There are 6 billion people waiting for our leadership we need to be figuring out how to activate capacity in all the countries so we get as many manufacturers as possible up and running. So I want to, I want to talk about that more in a, a second and, and, and the TRIPS waiver because I think um, that's that's a really interesting point in terms of how do we get the, the global supply up, not just through the companies that we've been using to date. Frida, I'd love to go back to you just to get your take on this. 
Um, you know, you've said Mexico has has done some things right as it comes to the vaccine. Obviously, it's not happening throughout the world, and, and there's still more that needs to be done in Mexico. Why do you think the global vaccine response has been so lacking from, from your perspective, and what are the implications ethically and, and morally? From my perspective as a young woman uh, who, who born in a country with a low middle income, which is very unique because the 10% of the population concentrate the 80% of the wealth of the countries even before the pandemic. So, so it is challenging for me to identify with, with some phrases that authorities, that different authorities or global leaders uh, states when the pandemic started. I mean, um, listen, we are on, we are all in the same boat. We are in this together and let no one behind makes sense to me. However, as the crisis has unfolded, the fact has become evident that we are not all together in the same boat navigating the pandemic. Also, we are all on the same planet. Some go on a judge and others barely manage to keep their heads above the water by clinging with all their might to a piece of driftwood while millions have unfortunately already drowned. So I think that one of the biggest failures in the global vaccine distribution is that the leaders or authorities who makes the who are making the decisions are not familiar with the structural injustice that underlie the social determinants of health and nationalism as pretty and Reshma said is a big problem too. Big countries are not supporting other countries which are still struggling with the coronavirus and cannot negotiate for vaccines. Of course, some of those countries have options like the COVAX mechanisms, but as Priti and Reshma said, um, this international scheme to ensure equal access to COVID-19 vaccine is 140 million doses short because of India continuing COVID crisis. So, the largest single supplier to the COVAX mechanism um, has made none of its planned shipments since export were suspended in March. So the pandemic is a vivid reminder that everyone on the planet should be concerned with making vaccines available. There is no ethical justification for limiting access to countries that cannot pay or any other criteria that have long been used to deny equitable access to the vaccine and other stuff like oxygen or specific medicines to diminish coronavirus symptoms or severe cases of coronavirus. So I think that global leaders has to take a time to, to make things different. Thanks for your um, really, really appreciate that perspective. So let's let's take off that. If there is, I mean, if we can stipulate that there's uh, ethical obligations and 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 ramifications and, and rationale for ensuring that there are more vaccines around the world. Um, Resh, I'd love to go to you on, on Preeti's previous point on the, we need to ensure that there's more people making the vaccine. So we'd love to, to hear a little bit about, you know, we've, we've heard about the TRIPS waiver. We've heard that, that President Biden um, you know, supports um, uh, ensuring that 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 um, you know that, that that it can be waived. What's happening? Why does that matter? What's happening around the world? Um, and what are the arguments against it too? I, I think the main one you hear is, well, it's too complicated to actually make the vaccine, so are we allowing too many people to to make it? But I'd love to hear your 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 thoughts on that too. Yeah. Um... So I will say, you know, it, it was very heartening to see that um, President Biden and Ambassador Tai did indicate support for a limited waiver, but the limitations have um, also consequences for the rest of the world. 
It is limited only to vaccines, not to diagnostics and other therapeutics that are desperately needed now when we're seeing a surge um, and people being hospitalized and dying as a result of COVID. And so, um, you know, that's something I just wanted to put as a framing point. Like I know this session is focused on vaccines, but from a clinical perspective, if somebody's coming to the hospital, we also need other things to be able to take care of them. And access to that is being threatened at this moment. Um, so the waiver is very important for a number of reasons. I know Preeti will go a lot more into this, but it is an enabling step, an enabling critical step to being to allow for um, a number of other uh, participants, especially this manufacturing capacity that we're hearing about around the world, um, to be able to produce these vaccines without any sort of legal or political repercussions um, that we oftentimes see when um, countries, even during public health emergencies, try to overcome intellectual property um, to be able to increase access. And there's been various, um, you know, various uh, instances where um, both companies and, and high income countries have gone after uh, countries when they're trying to serve their citizens um, amidst a health crisis. Um, the other part of, of this too is that, um, you know, the waiver um, has also uh, led to a, a conversation about what are, what is happening in terms of global vaccine access. It's been really interesting to see kind of the role of power also in these conversations, that the waiver in threatening the power of the pharmaceutical industry and the major vaccine manufacturers in saying that we need to have um, more manufacturing capacity in low middle income countries. We need to be able to remove this barrier um, for access that um, these companies have now started talking about plans um, and bottlenecks um, that were not really discussed before, but were much more in the background for low middle income countries. And what has also become clear to me is the lack of transparency across the supply chain um, for um, COVID-19 vaccines. We hear about these bottlenecks from, from companies. They reassure us that they can provide X billion doses by this end of this year, that they will be able to vaccinate the rest of the world. They came out with a five point plan um, a little bit earlier today about how they're gonna be providing access to low middle income countries. But what's glaringly absent is the lack of transparency of the supply chain, the fact that they are hoarding materials as a part of their safety stocks that is limiting manufacturing capacity around the world, um, that um, these companies are going to be dictating prices um, for uh, countries. And in fact, in Latin America, we also saw them bullying countries when trying to provide access. Um, they were asking for sovereign assets to be given as collateral in exchange for providing doses. And so again, this sort of power dynamic of when is when are we gonna to come to a point in the midst of a pandemic where world leaders are gonna shift that power away from these companies um, in terms of ensuring transparency of the supply chain and providing mechanisms so low middle income countries that do have manufacturing capacity and expertise can step in to be able to serve their own their own countrymen and also to other, um, other folks around the world. Um, and I think that's the, the kind of the, the key question that the waiver has also brought up, you know, the, the shift in the power dynamics and what are the mechanisms that we need in the midst of a global crisis to bring everybody to the table, especially those that are in the midst of everything right now. I, the, the, Preeti, I'd love to go to you both on, on the, the concept of power and the concept of profit. How much is that um, motivating this response and, and not to get sort of, you know, too theoretical or existential about it, but, but is there an opportunity to, to push past that or is sort of the, the quest for profit from these companies overriding any global uh, equitable response to, to, to vaccine production and distribution? Right, absolutely. And so I think what people don't always understand is when we use the phrase intellectual property or patents, what we're talking about in essence is monopoly. How can I block anybody else from having power to control the market? And that's what we, uh, I really liked uh, Reshma's example of Moderna. That is a vaccine that we as taxpayers have nearly 100% funded to the tune of $2.5 billion, both on the R&D side and through advanced purchase commitments, uh, but we're not co-owners in it. We handed over the rights to a private company who has not only made a lot of money already, but Wall Street analysts are saying that they're going to have a market cap of $100 billion 
because they're going to take that technology platform and use it for a number of other commercial purposes. But we're in a pandemic right now, and we need to be scaling up vaccine access, and they need to share that technology. And the CEO of Moderna is on record saying, I'm not losing sleep over this IP waiver. Nobody's going to make me do anything. This is capitalism. Okay, he didn't say that part, but that's what he meant. You know, we don't we don't step in and tell companies what to do today. But that's what has to change in this pandemic. There have to be different rules to this game. In India, literally, there were 4,500 deaths. Is that right, Reshma? 4,500 deaths a day last week. Like, what are we talking about right now? How is sharing knowledge not a central part of what is part of our response right now. And the crazy thing is the media here in the States is reporting every day about the Indian surge, is trying to take Americans and Europeans through the horrific things that are unfolding on the ground. But what's not being said in every news article is that there's still no plan. There is no plan. Now we're hearing that serum isn't going to be supplying COVAX till the end of the year. But what's the plan for India? What is the plan for Brazil? There's no plan. This is really, it's unacceptable. Like this is what I, I hope the Biden administration is going to take very seriously and come forward, not only with support for the TRIPS waiver and transparent negotiations and getting the G7 to the table, but what's the plan that accompanies that? Intellectual property is one step. It is a root source of power, but then what? How are we making these companies share their knowledge? How are we unlocking global manufacturing capacity? How are we getting leaders in other countries, including India, who are quite frankly bungling their pandemic response to step up and take ownership and responsibility and come up with national strategies? All of this is unclear today and it has to change and it has to change fast. So I wanna to get to what the activist response could can can be to that, but but want to get to some audience questions first. And so just just on um, that, I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of um, bring two to, to together and, and get your take on it. So so one is which which I think you you've mostly addressed, but would sharing vaccine IP um, allow production in other countries? Obviously, Bill Gates, which I think got a lot of attention, said that that IP was not the barrier. Um, and then the second part of that is how do we know that there's free manufacturing capacity in other nations? So um, how can those manufacturers around the world gain the tech uh, and, and actual know-how to, to actually produce the, the shots? Can I, can I take this first question because I feel very strongly about it? Okay, Bill Gates, let's just talk about Bill Gates for a minute. Bill Gates made his wealth off of the intellectual property system. He is wedded to an ideology about patents and intellectual property, but has imposed that ideology on global public health with disproportionate influence over how our global public health functions today. Bill Gates saying IP is not a barrier doesn't mean anything to me. Country governments like South Africa, like the entire African Union, like India and like governments in Latin America telling me that if IP was waived on vaccines, on diagnostics, on raw materials, on PPP could help them scale up, that matters to me. And this goes back to me, this all goes back to structural racism and colonialism. Who are we listening to? Why are we listening to people just because they are rich? That is not who we should be listening to in the middle of a pandemic. We should be listening to people with expertise on the ground. I have worked for 20 years with manufacturers, not only in India, but across all the emerging markets. I am telling you that there is capacity. There was actually a good article last week. You can pull it up by Achal Prabala from India, and he co-authored it with Chelsea Clinton in The Atlantic. It's the first piece in a few part series. And they detail what manufacturing capacity exists in these countries that we should be tapping into to scale. We have to stop listening to people like Bill Gates who are driven by other concerns and don't actually have boots on the ground. Yeah, no, very, very powerful and, and appreciate that point, Preeti. Um, Reshma, I'm curious if you have thoughts on, on that or the other question, just how we know that there's manufacturing capacity in other countries and how they would actually gain the, the tech and know how to, to produce the shots. Yeah, so it's been interesting to see some of the media coverage. Unfortunately, that's not as prominently 
like featured and really should be all over the place where um, like Achel and, and Chelsea Clinton's piece, they detail some of the manufacturers that have already said they're ready. BioLice in Canada, a Bangladeshi firm, for instance, another firm that's in South Korea, Singapore, we're also seeing this in Africa as well, where there is manufacturing capacity being noted. And also, um, you know, the, the heads of these manufacturing facilities are saying that if we had the recipe, we could be able to produce a vaccine within six, eight months. And that's, you know, incredible, especially when we're anticipating, even with COVAX, or even with these mechanisms that these major multinational manufacturers are telling us about, not having vaccines in these countries for years to come. And so, you know, this is the moment right now in planning a pandemic response and making sure that we're having everybody at the table, that we need to be getting all of these different manufacturing facilities, um, these recipes immediately to be able to produce the vaccines and also the, the diagnostics and therapeutics as well, as quickly as possible. Um, uh, Reuters um, had also kind of an overview of this, but what was also telling is that the WHO um, set up something called the mRNA Technology Transfer Hub, and within like days, they got 50, 50, 50 requests from different manufacturers um, saying that they had capacity if they were able to get the recipe to start producing. And so we do have mechanisms in place to be able to transfer this technology we just need to be able to compel this transfer at this point. And that's where we need world leaders to step in to be able um, to, to, to be actually make this move forward as quickly as possible. I'm gonna get back to the notion of that global plan and what that actually looks like, but, but let's, um, let's tackle activist perspective a little bit here. Frida, again, you're on the, 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 the ground and, and you talked um, really eloquently earlier about the, the ethical importance of a global response. From your perspective, um, what can be done from sort of an activist perspective on the, on the ground to improve the, the, the global response? First, um, I think that it is crucial to stress that there is a collective responsibility or collective moral obligation to improve global health response. So no matter our background, education, or intrinsic characteristics for acting and collaborating in the vaccinations campaigns in our countries. Also, I am conscious that not everyone is aware of what we are living. So my work as an activist is to educate my community and listen to them about their doubts and fears about vaccination and coronavirus. So we have to establish a continued dialogue with the members of our communities. And that dialogue has to be not just in social media. This has to be face to face. So here in Mexico, there are not permanent places for vaccination. In each city, there are vaccination brigades for specific dates. So it is crucial to be aware of when and where you can access a vaccine in your town. So when I realized that there was a lack of health education strategy in those brigades, I enrolled as a volunteer and I started to give small workshops about how vaccines work and the measures that they still must follow for the people to vaccinate. So when they came back to their homes, they could tell their relatives and friends about the, the vaccination process and the information we gave them. Nowadays, the trust in the government and particularly in health authorities is deficient. So the people tend to trust more in the people who are working or collaborating in the vaccination sites that is why we don't have to miss any opportunity to educate and share why we must be aware of how is moving the global vaccination strategy. And I think that what we do at the local level impacts the global level. So every action counts. And we don't have to minimize the, the impact. To, to end, I want to emphasize something that I read yesterday in Twitter, that is that the pandemic ends when it ends for everyone, period. 
which I think is, is such an important thing to think about in the U.S. as, as we're, we're pretending that the, the pandemic is over. Preeti, you, you talked earlier about the U.S. not having a plan um, and sort of all of this dispersed work going on. Um, so what are some ideas on, on what that plan could look like um, if you were talking to the Biden administration, they've put some some folks in. Gail Smith, the former uh, administrator of, of USAID, is now directing the, the the COVID global response. What are some things that the, you think the US should be doing on a global scale? So in regards to the IP waiver, I think we need to get the G7 on board and then we need to move through these negotiations quickly, transparently, and as expansively as Reshma was saying as possible. In terms of unlocking manufacturing capacity, uh, I think there's a lot of noise in Washington right now that's being put forward by the pharmaceutical lobbies in relation to capacity and safety and the inability of other manufacturers to understand the technology. I would really urge the administration to cut through that noise. We've seen the industry do this at every major treatment rollout you know, HIV, hepatitis C over the years. We've also seen them do this time and time again with vaccine rollout. We saw this with hepatitis B uh, where manufacturers in high income countries were basically saying that there was no way that manufacturers in other countries would understand the scientifically complex nature of the hep B vaccine. And manufacturers in India took that as a personal challenge. They brought the price down from $23 to one and they scaled up immunization for hundreds of millions of people. And so uh, the same thing is happening again. There's nothing miraculous from a scientific perspective about mRNA vaccines. Um, and we know this because Moderna and Pfizer are contract manufacturing with people right now. Where there's a will, there's a way. So I would urge the administration to really go outside of sort of the usual circles that have turned into a little bit of an echo chamber. Um, questioning other countries and reinforcing these sort of American exceptionalism ideas in relation to um, manufacturing that just aren't true um, and seek out those of us who have worked on the ground, who do have maps of manufacturers who are talking to people in country um, and can at least point the administration in the right direction of where manufacturing capacity exists. So I want to I want to just follow up on that quickly because we have an audience question that that speaks pretty directly to that. Um, and so I'll say, you know, the, the the question is, is it really better to have uh, a number of small producers around the world making vaccines? They might be, not be able to optimize production and lower prices like mass pr massive producers. And, and we've obviously had three main ones in the United States could be errors in production that lower trust in, in the vaccines. So so given that this sort of goes directly to, to what you're saying, curious on, on your thoughts there. Yeah, concentrating supply within a small number of suppliers has never been demonstrated to bring prices down. We've never achieved global scale for anything by just having a couple of suppliers controlling supply. The thing that has been demonstrated to bring down prices time and time again for global medical products is competition. Now, in this case, competition may be the wrong word, but expanding the manufacturing base is what brings prices down. That's why you need uh, as many suppliers as possible producing. You don't achieve economies of scale without that. You don't achieve the ability to do pooled procurement, which is what was supposed to be happening. Uh, and so I would advocate very strongly that yes, it is. And I don't know how small we're talking about. We're not talking about mom and pop shops. We're talking about companies that have track records producing vaccines. You know, half of all vaccines, the 2.4 billion doses that are procured by UNICEF are from manufacturers in low and middle income countries. We have to understand that low and middle income countries are already a key source for manu vaccine manufacturing and supply worldwide. We're talking about tapping into the capacity that already exists out there for large scale manufacturing. Just, I just wanted to add just one yeah. thing to this. You know, it, you re, so part of my research is actually looking at pricing of vaccines and looking at historical trends and what that might mean for COVID-19 vaccines. And so some, one uh, analogous vaccine that we looked at was the flu vaccine here in the United States. We have multiple manufacturers, we have multiple products, yet over the past two decades, despite it, like the COVID-19 vaccine being publicly financed, like the discovery and development was actually funded completely by the US Department of Defense, the prices of this have risen pretty dramatically um, over the last two decades. And so 
We expect that to happen here with COVID-19 vaccines, especially as we re realize that it's going to be endemic, that we're going to have uh, booster shots likely required every single year, especially to address different variants. What that means here in the United States and also for the rest of the world is that as we shift away from the idea of like public procurement and from government procurement, we're going to see rising prices and then also the private sector having to pay a premium price like they do for other vaccines right now. And that's going to limit access and that's going to limit the government's ability, even in the United States, to be able to rebuild a public health infrastructure that had so many cracks in it that caused the pandemic, to be honest, to ravage um, the, the country, but also across the world as well. And the second point I just wanted to make is that we also should keep in mind that we have new manufacturers that had no proven track record that are producing vaccines right now. Moderna had never produced a vaccine, yet because of public investment uh, from the US government that 100%, again, for R&D, manufacturing, and also purchasing, we've actually made it a very successful company and a company that is profiting immensely from this pandemic. Similarly, we have other com companies like Novavax that again, the US government is subsidizing um, its R&D and also manufacturing and purchasing uh, to bring them uh, to market and also basically creating um, an environment for this company to thrive despite having no track record whatsoever. So it is possible very much so with public investment and really distributing it across the world for different manufacturers to get these companies uh, up to speed and to be able to produce mRNA vaccines uh, for the rest of the world in record time. Let me, we might have time for, for this as, as, as a last question, but and something for all of you, Preeti, you talked about something I'm interested in, which is sort of the US needs to get past its exceptionalist approach and, and sort of have almost a, a, a broader take here. I, I'm wondering if there's a way to talk about what the possibilities are if we actually um, either in the U.S. or globally are able to, to execute on this strategy. I mean, something that the SNF Agora Institute, you know, thinks a lot about is, is what does it mean to strengthen global democracy? And, and I'm curious um, to, to, to get your take on uh, maybe, you know, if, if in a year's time we're back here and, and, and we have actually opened up manufacturing and we have coordinated a global response, um, is there a way to frame a global response in a way that, that especially for the US, but also for democracies around the world, there, there's possibilities to it. So curious if there's if there's reactions to that. Yeah, so I've spent most of my career trying to democratize the medicine system, meaning the system from drug development all the way through to drug access. And specifically, we have spent a lot of time working on the patent or IP system. And you know, the related systems like the clinical trial system, um, suppliers and manufacturers, and looking at how do you increase engagement of the public in systems that are exclusively meant for corporations and universities and other private actors. And I really believe that that's the answer. The reason decisions like this can get taken during a pandemic where taxpayer funding funds the development of a vaccine and then the government has no control is because we have not put people back into these systems and affected public. And so um, that's where we're starting this year in the U.S. is how do you put people back into an agency like the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, which has absolutely no room for public participation. Even the public advisory committee of the PTO has representatives from Facebook or Eli Lilly, but no public interest representation. And so these are the kinds of shifts that we're going to need to make uh, to democratize systems all through the medicines, you know, continuum. Uh, in terms of the future, this isn't our last pandemic. Uh, I think that we need a much more connected and global system. We have systems like that in place, but again, who's calling the shots? Who's making the decisions? Um, COVAX, we can go back to Bill Gates and disproportionate you know, influence of philanthropy and philanthropic capitalism in particular, influencing how global health mechanisms are functioning. But part of it is really unpacking which countries, which governments have the power in those um, arenas and how do we make sure that there's more representation from countries, from people, from communities that are affected to be 
um, at those tables and driving those decision, that decision making. And so that's what has to shift now, especially as these conversations start about what's the pandemic treaty and how do we learn from this? I heard that people in Geneva are now saying that um, we need upstream solutions that you know, public funding should never be given out without um, access conditionalities. 15 months ago, we already knew that. Why wasn't it enshrined and codified in law then? Why wasn't this required? And now we're here and there's still not a solution. They're still not saying, let's go in and take that technology back. And so for me, it comes back to the democratization of everything, R&D and investment, patents, clinical trials, supply, distribution, and access, that whole system now, we got to work it through. I'm curious if you have have any thoughts on on sort of I, I thought that was articulated very well in terms of democratizing everything, but any any sense of the possibility here if we get this right? Sorry, I wasn't sure who was directed to. The oh, question. I'll start with Reshma and then we'll end with Frida. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I, again, you know, I think, you know, like I mentioned before, I think we are definitely at an inflection point um, in the pandemic and thinking about global vaccine access, but really global public health and what this means for participation of countries. We've seen the failures of form shifting, the bilateral deals that kind of circumvented the global structures that we do have. Um, the idea that pharmaceutical companies were given kind of more prominence instead of taxpayers um, who ultimately funded the development of these vaccines. So I'm, I'm hopeful that the administration and obviously through efforts from a number of us and our, our allies around the world, that there will be pay, you know, attention paid to the fact that when these agreements are being made with companies, especially for global public health, there has to be inclusion and transparency to the rest of the world. Um, one of the things that we've been working on and thinking about is, you know, how can President Biden use mechanisms like the waiver, but also the Defense Production Act to compel transparency, to see where are these bottlenecks and to be able to make sure that everyone around the world, especially manufacturing um, experts and facilities around the, uh, around the world, know where the supply bottlenecks are so they can have a seat at the table to be able to say, we have the solutions, here's what we need to be able to reach our goal of global vaccine access. And starting from that um, sort of vantage point of making sure there's not an asymmetry of information between you know, the government and in providing global health, public health and only allowing access to a privileged few, few that are wealthy or that have corporate power, instead opening it up to the rest of the world, I think is gonna be really important. Um, and some of that means enhancing our global structures, but also making sure that those set, that that set, that um, the notion of like the the idea of that this asymmetric information, even in those global public health structures, doesn't continue to exist. This is what we saw at Covax. To be honest, there's been a lot of calls for transparency of the agreements between Covax and a number of manufacturers. That still hasn't come to fruition. Um, we're also seeing at the WHO um, calls for transparency as well um, across the board. But this also means making sure that everybody has the same seat at the table, and that means they have access to the information so they can be able to help and make decisions as a global community. Really appreciate that, Frida. In our last minute, um, any any hopes that that you have from listening to this panel for for the global pandemic response? I just want to say about the importance of create a global mechanism that help us to really uh, distribute all these kind of vaccines and treatments in in the more affordable and uh, and with a global health equity approach. So so what Priti said about democratize all the process. I think that that could be great, and also that will give voice to to other to other authorities that are not listened now. Really, really appreciate that that perspective. Um, thank all of you uh, for for joining, Priti, Frida, Reshma. Uh, this was a. a Wonderful. I don't know if I want to say wonderful, but sobering and important conversation for us all to, to, to keep in mind. Stephen, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you, Scott. And thank you for the great discussion. And, and yes, thank you, Frida, Preeti, and Reshma for joining us and, and for your powerful advocacy. Uh, you, you gave all of us um, a lot to think about and push for in our own lives. Um, finally, I'd like to thank our audience for spending time with us today and, and invite you to join us again on Friday for the final event in our Democratic Spaces series. 
Bridging the Urban Rural Divide, which will take place at noon. And will be a discussion of how citizens of our two Americas, rural and urban, can come together across geographic, political, and racial divides to find common cause and mutual respect and begin to find solutions for the economic health and other problems so many Americans are facing. You'll find more information about that event at smfagora.jhu.edu or click on the link posted in the chat. We hope you'll join us. You can also sign up for our bi-monthly e-newsletter by clicking the link in the chat as well. And finally, a recording of today's conversation will be available on our website soon on our YouTube channel. So check it out there. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day.